that particular passage of scripture is all we need. So I'm done. I want you to notice the context in which Paul said those words, wrote those words to Timothy. This is his last will and testament to the young Timothy who was called by God to take up the mantle from the Apostle Paul. Paul's on death row. He's not, wor he not worried about a virus. He's not even worried about the sword, which is going to lop his head off, probably within days or weeks. And he writes to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, yeah. but of love, power, sound mind. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of comments, and I always get, uh, watch themselves. I can get in trouble when I stray too far from my notes. But we're witnessing not the tearing off the roof. Ray said last week the house is burning and nobody seems to care. Ray, I'm going to switch metaphors on you just a little bit. Uh, you know, you can take a roof off the house and still live in it. You can pull all the, electric, all the electrical wires and the plumbing out and still live in it. You can even take down the walls and still live in it. But if you mess with the foundation, you're toast. Yeah. And what does Scripture say? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the people do? And I am shocked and astonished that many among us are almost celebrating the destruction of our foundations. That's all I better say. But it's in me. Peaceful. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to Corinthians, recorded these words. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is God. When we see our liberties being taken away, we know the Spirit of the Lord is being chased out. He is being evicted from our very hearts, our lives, our country. And we don't want to see the upshot of that. But we will. As Dickens said, Charles Dickens in his probably one of the most famous, probably I'm going to say it's a top five novel. I never read it completely. I had good friends who taught it in school. But there was part of it that I have read from the book, The Tale of Two Cities. Do you know when that was written? 1859, one year before the most momentous election in American history of Abraham Lincoln. 1859. He began the novel this way. These are the best of times, and these are the worst of times. I'm going to focus on the best of times. today because my God is a God of peace. Our God is a God of joy. Our God is a God that flips the divine paradox on its head of the best of times and the worst of times because out of this crucible of this, we're not in the last days anymore. Not in them. We're living them. You say, well, what's, what's the difference between in them and living them? Say that you're, I've been here and we're in the last days all my life. And that's a long life. But we're living them right now. I always wonder what it's going to be like. This is what they look like. Father in heaven, we see the days so we know what they look like. Because we're living them. We're seeing them. But the great need of our hearts and our lives is to know more fully what you look like. In this world where there's so many, even within Christianity, even often within our church, there's views of you that I don't so often see comport with Scripture. Because you're a God of love, you're a God of justice, you're a God of mercy, you're all those things. You're not one or the other. 
None of your attributes are in competition with another attribute. You're all. Amen. We thank you for that. The realization. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is actually the fifth message I've given amen. since this shutdown began. And it's been interesting as I reviewed them this week, the, the ebb and flow of them from the first one, which was about fear and faith, fear versus faith, to the last one before this one, which was about a, a fresh look at what it means to render to Caesar and render to God. Because we often forget that rendering to Caesar, to Caesar is not a carte blanche to render to Caesar. Jesus never intended it to be. Paul certainly didn't when he wrote Romans 13, but somehow we've made that one. Well, whatever the government says, we're going to do. If you read carefully what Paul is saying, you know who was emperor when Paul wrote Romans? Probably early 50s? It was Nero. He was just a pup. He became emperor at 17. Committed suicide at 31. They say some more about that in a few minutes. So Paul was not saying, you just kiss up to Nero willy-nilly. No way. No way, no way. However, in this message, I've decided to go a little bit different direction than what I've done previously. And that is, it's been catalyzed by my reading in the book Acts of the Apostles. It has been one of the greatest blessings of my life, what has happened in the last six months. A good friend of ours, a dear friend of ours, sent us some of these new sets of the Conflict of the Ages. They're just beautiful. Conflict is called Conflict Beautiful. And I decided I've never done this in my life. I've read every one of those five books, several of them, two, three, four times, like the Ray Controversy. But I've never gone straight through them. From Patriarchs and Prophets, which was the second book written, not the first. You know which is the first? The last one. The Great Controversy was the first one written. Then you've got Patriarchs and Prophets. And then following that is the one in the middle, Desire of Ages, the centerpiece. And then it follows with the book that I'm reading. I'll, I'll probably finish it on Monday. The Acts of the Apostles. And then we go to the Great Controversy in July. Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. You want to know what the last days really look like? Study Acts of the Apostles. What God's men and women went through in that first century, after, in those first few decades after Christ, is almost parallels our day. In many, many, many ways it does, I will suggest to you. So this book, Acts of the Apostles, of the apostles. Notice it didn't say just faith of the apostles, we were talking about earlier. Acts of the apostles. Are we Christians only when we come in here? Or when we're alone at home? Are we, or do our acts flow outside of these four walls here and at home? I've been struck by the experience of the great Apostle Paul in particular. There's about 13 chapters in the book of Acts of the Apostles that cover the last few years of Paul's life. Those experiences that I've already mentioned, I'm convinced, parallel, parallel our day and God's call upon our lives. And let's be honest. Most in the body of Christ are not ready for the times that are upon us. As I said, the last four months revealed that to us. It's Amen. revealed it to me. If it, if it hasn't to you, then talk to me about your experience. You're, you're doing great. Amen. So I can say thank God for these last few months in that regard. Amen. It has exposed our unreadiness for the times in which we're living. That's why I've chosen to title this sermon, The Apostle of Discernment. Paul got it.
Paul had a clear-eyed vision on his day because he had such a clear-eyed view vision of who Jesus Christ was. Not only through his study in the Old Testament, which is the only scriptures they had, of course, but he'd seen him. He'd seen him at the gate of Damascus. So Paul, Paul did not just know the books that I've mentioned so far. Did you know Paul knew history? Paul knew the politics of his day. Paul knew the economic issues of his day. Paul understood it all. He was a complete student. The man at the point of our study is still energetic though old and worn out. I can identify with that somebody. <laughs> Did you know that Ellen White says as Paul reached the end of his life, he became more intense? I thought we were, the old people, we were supposed to send them out to, to the, that's what we're hearing these days, just send them out to the pasture. Let these younger bucks whose ears are not dry yet take over. That's not scripture. It's the body of Christ. We don't say, we talk about segregation and integration and racism and whatever right now. I see the same thing happening to some of us old people. We're being one year old. It's a form of bigotry. <laughs> the man is still energetic, though old and worn out. He's still courageous, though he lives in oppression. He's beaten to pulp. But he's still pursuing liberty in Christ. Amen. Paul was beaten 195 times with the fall. Jesus only 39. Is that right? It's close. He was beaten three times with rocks. So he, he went down, he was beaten to his knees at least eight times. And the reason the Romans would choose 39 is because they believed that 40 would kill them. So if you look at physical suffering, Jesus, Paul suffered much more than Jesus did. But we know that Jesus experienced the death of the cross, the curse of God against sin. Paul says, I hadn't seen anything compared Amen. to what Jesus did. Amen. Also, Paul was stoned, left for dead. Also, Paul was spent a whole night in the Mediterranean, and I was going to do some checking. What is the water temperature where he was, where he was shipwrecked? I doubt if it's the Atlantic. <laughs> I doubt that. Do you realize what kind of man we're studying, we're looking at here? He was full of the Holy Ghost. And brother, Carl, I don't know what all your situation is, but if you have COVID-19 and I get it, there's no better place to get it than right here. Yeah. Yeah. I am less afraid of the disease, even at my age, than I am, I'm much more afraid of not trusting God fully. Amen. Amen. That's not presumption. Don't, don't, don't throw that word on me. I've asked myself, what would Paul do during this pandemic? I'll just say this, Paul loved liberty except for his chains, he said. This I know, this man was filled with the early rain, Holy Ghost power, who on his manacled way to Rome, and he was manacled all the way to Rome, he was constantly attached to a soldier, constantly, 20 Four, seven. Even when he wrote the letter to the Philippians, which is about joy in Christ, he was manacled to a soldier. You got problems? Check out Paul. On his way to Italy, because he's going to have an encounter with Nero, on the island of Malta, just 50 miles off the coast of Italy, 
the Apostle Paul healed all diseases. He healed all diseases. I say we need the early rain, don't you? Amen. If we had the early rain, maybe we'd get the latter rain. <laughs> Even the most contagious of diseases could not stand before God Amen. in the person of Paul. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The date is about 62 A.D., about 30 years after the crucifixion of Christ. Pagan Rome, as I mentioned, is still ruling the world. That spoiled tyrant, that's what I call him, that spoiled tyrant Nero is in his 20s when Paul shows up in Rome. But he's not there. We're not going to take him all the way to Rome in our study today. But I just want to point that out. In the context of our story, I bring up Nero for this purpose. And it's very humbling to me to say this. And I'm not going to say it as clearly as I probably could. Sadly and tellingly, Paul's opposition is not from Nero. Paul's opposition is from his own fellow Jews. The doctrinally correct state of the dead, Saturday keeping, clean meat eating, teetotaling Jew, the Messiah rejected. Are you following and thinking? Undoubtedly, Paul knows that Jesus has said that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So he's not shocked by this. It's understandable. But nevertheless, it's woefully painful. Have you ever been opposed directly in your own family? Some of you have. For throughout this, his ministry, and this blows me away about the Apostle Paul, Paul had no greater burden than for his most virulent and violent enemies, his fellow Jews. Yep. Romans 9, 10, and 11, those whole chapters are devoted to his love and concern for his brothers and sisters as Jews. That should say something to us today as frustrated as we sometimes get. This reality alone, his love for his fellow Jews, was enough to drive him toward Jerusalem one final time. So he's in Greece when he gets this call from God. It's time to go, to, go home one more time. It's 1,300 miles, according to my calculation, grueling miles from where he was in Greece to Jerusalem. And we're going to take a brief look at, on his way there. We can, he's, this could be probably a two-part series. But we'll take a brief look at his experience in Miletus. Miletus in modern Turkey, where he swings by from Greece, swings by Turkey on his way down. For the, what happened, what he wrote from Miletus is very foundational to understanding who the great Apostle Paul is, was. And what a contrast to the shallowness, the cowardice of so many of us who claim the name of Christ. Oh, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Lord, if you want me to say this, I think it popped out of my brain. I read about three weeks ago a statement from a leader about to the fearful. And in that statement, he had the audacity, the temerity, to tell me that the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos was helpless and scared. If that doesn't raise the, the hour or the hair on the back of your neck, what else could I say he could? Brothers and sisters, these early reign apostles were afraid of nothing. Amen. Amen. Don't tell me they were scared and helpless. 
Who was it? Uh, who was the emperor under John when he tried to boil him? It was Domitian. Not Diocletian. He was the bad guy from 300 to 310. This is Domitian at the end of the first century. They throw this old man, this old man, into this pot of burning oil, boiling oil. And finally Domitian says, get him out of here. I can't kill him. He's helpless and scared. I think the fear was on the other side. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes, listen to these words by the great apostle Paul. And listen, nobody can be a bigger afraid of cat than me, in and of myself. But I have to remind myself that on the cross, my flesh was obliterated, but my body was redeemed through the resurrection. I like the way that sounded right then. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, as Paul descends from Greece. He's in Miletus, as I said. There in Miletus, he summoned the elders from Ephesus because he, he, has, he has a burden to share with these brothers from Ephesus while he has a layover in Miletus. Acts chapter 20, we pick it up, verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, What's this? From the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the body of the Romans. No, we don't. Yeah, they the By the body of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing. I kept back nothing that was helpful. He didn't deliver it all, but if it was helpful, the Spirit impressed him. Deliver it. Deliver it. But proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Here's a man who's going to Jerusalem to get bound physically. But he says, I go bound in the spirit. That's powerful. We've got a brother sitting here on the third row that appears before some of the, well, the highest courts in Canada. Brother Jay, may each time you show up there, may you go bound in the spirit. Amen. Ah, oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. To Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying the chains and tribulation await me. But none of these things move me. He was helpless and scared too. I guess it's like John. Well, I'd like to be that helpless and scared, wouldn't you? None of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I test to you, test, testify to you this day. This is powerful too. I am innocent of the blood of all men. What does that mean? He explains it in the next verse. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. That's what it means to be innocent of the love of men. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock, you brothers in Ephesus. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up inside the church, speaking perverse things to drive away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, 
I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. You know, Ellen said that the most fearsome warning to be given to the world is the third page of Smith's. Last verse. And now, brethren, I commend to you God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The little lady who wrote the book that catalyzed this sermon, Acts of the Apostles, was 83 years old when she wrote that book. To give you a little hope. <laughs> she was 87 when she died, and she was just finishing up Prophets and Kings. Actually published one year after, two years after, one or two years after her death. Oh, there's still stuff for us to do, regardless of our age. It is clear that Paul will see their faces no more until Jesus pronounces the resurrection. To the ordinary Christian, most of us today, to the normal, everyday mind, this is a suicide mission by Paul. But, as we were asked last week from this pulpit, are we ambassadors or are we secret agents? Paul could have been a secret agent. Do you know where he went as soon as he got to Jerusalem? He went into the temple. Not to flaunt, but to witness. Are we ambassadors or are we undercover agents? This is a question we must ask ourselves. We must admit that many times undercover, going along with the crowd, is often our gig these days. But not so with the apostle of discernment. So it goes on every stop to Jerusalem, every place. Don't go, Paul. Don't go, Paul. They're going to take you out, Paul. Don't do that, Paul. The Sanhedrin, the ultimate swamp in Jerusalem, will take you out, Paul. Paul, you know that when a Christian is, out, is outspoken as you are, there's a two-tier justice system. Justice for me, but not for thee. The rule of law and due process, not going to happen for you, Paul. Oh, but Paul had asserted, nothing moves me from the providence of God. Like his Savior's commitment to the cross, especially after Gethsemane. Remember what Isaiah 50 verse 7 says about the Savior? He set his face like a what? How many of you know what? There's some older people like me here. Here's my illustration of Flint. When my brother and I, when I was a little boy, we're talking about when I was probably eight, nine, ten years old, we used to go across the Bonita Creek, another two or three hundred feet would be up on the railroad track. On the railroad track, they had all these round stones, roundish, not round, but oblong stones. They all looked the same, you know, covering the railroad bed. Do they still have that stuff? Oh, no, some of, places. Some places. We know what we'd do? Throw them. We'd throw them. What would we try to hit? Anything. No, 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 we didn't. We were not wasteful. We were environmentally sensitive. <laughs> We would throw them and hit, to try to hit the rail, say, to the back of the church there. Which, you know, we'd miss more times than we'd hit. But when we'd hit, what were we looking for? Sparks. 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 We knew if it sparked, that was a flint stone, no pun intended. <laughs> Setting one is hard, super hard. Where's Jesus couldn't be moved, Paul says, and nothing moves me. That's flint stone talk. Amen. Immovable, indomitable. This indomitable, unswerving spirit of Paul, with that in mind, let's move forward. He's not long in Jerusalem, as I mentioned, before the Jewish leader 
identify, a Jewish leader identifies him, he's not where he's supposed to be according to them. And like Elijah of old, they drag out the troubler of Israel. This personal representative of Jesus, whom they had crucified 30 years earlier, must be shut up. Somehow re reminiscent, at least in my day, our day, to the attempts to silence and especially distort 